The views, information, or opinions expressed in this podcast are solely those of the individuals. This content is not intended to malign or disparage any organization, group, or individual. Hello, and welcome to True Crime Daily's The Sidebar, where we take you inside the courtroom of the most high-profile and notorious cases from across the country. I'm your host, Joshua Ritter, currently a criminal defense lawyer based here in Los Angeles. Previously, I worked as a prosecutor with the LA District Attorney's Office for close to a decade. We're recording this on Tuesday, September 21st, 2021. Today, we are joined by defense attorney and trial lawyer, Steve Greenberg, based in Chicago, Illinois. We're discussing the R. Kelly trial currently taking place right now in New York as we speak. We are delighted to have Steve as a guest because until recently, he was one of R. Kelly's attorneys before withdrawing from the case in June of this year. Welcome, Steve. Good afternoon. How are you? Very good. Uh, Before we jump into all the details and drama around this case, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and your background, how you got started in criminal law? Sure. Uh, I like to call it criminal defense law because criminal law sort of implies that we're doing something wrong. Uh, (laughs) I... um, When I was a a youngster, I wanted to be a lawyer. I wanted to be a criminal defense attorney. Uh, I would watch a TV show called uh, Owen Marshall, and um, he had this young criminal defense attorney who worked with him, rode a motorcycle, all that cool stuff, based in Santa Barbara, California, actually. So my dream was to go to Santa Barbara and be this individual. Uh, I eventually did go out to California to try and go to law school, but unfortunately, I wasn't a good enough student to get into uh, UCLA or or Berkeley. Uh, So I came back to Illinois, uh, went to law school, graduated, sort of did everything and anything that came my way while I tried to build up a criminal defense practice. And uh, I think I know people nowadays here in Chicago and think that it's crime ridden. Uh, It's nothing compared to what it was back in the late 80s and the early 90s. So very quickly, I was able to Uh, build up a practice and I would try all the cases, try anything and everything. Uh, I was trying jury trials for $200. And and I think I worked my way up and and developed a reputation. I I sort of feel like I'm the exception because I was never a public defender, I was never a prosecutor, and I never worked for anybody. So I spent long, long hours uh, in the office reading lots of books on how to and and just doing a lot of heavy work that is fascinating so from day one you hung out your own shingle and it's been that way ever since it has been that way uh for i used to be able to say i was the youngest one uh, now 35 plus years give us a little bit of insight about the difference between the practice of state criminal defense and federal criminal defense um You know, people think they're different. Uh, Certainly the resources are very different. Uh, In a in a state criminal prosecution, it's a much more even playing field. Uh, It's also typically a more interesting case, more fun to do. I think that uh, that generally the the judges are a little bit easier. Uh, Maybe they have lower expectations. Um, The prosecutors sometimes are a little bit friendlier. Uh, whereas federal court, they've got all the resources in the world and their cases are much more developed. You know, the difference is in a federal indictment, typically they've done their entire investigation before your client is arrested and they've got it all neatly wrapped up. They've got people on wiretaps. They've got physical evidence. Uh, they don't touch the case unless they have those kinds of things. Whereas state court is much more of a street fight. Uh, it's much more of a he said, she said, as you know, and 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 usually it's a lot more fun. I, I will say that was something that really struck me when I finally left the DA's office after only practicing state law and uh, went private and had my first uh, kind of federal experience. It really does make you feel like you've gone from the Wild West to to something else entirely. I mean, mm-hmm. there's so much more of a kind of shoot from the hip mentality in state court. Um, and even with the kind of, the, like you said, pointed out the strength of the cases that the prosecutors will take to trial. We, we would take stuff to trial uh, as a prosecutor in the DA's office that the feds wouldn't even touch. Because right. like you said, where's the wiretaps? Where's the confession? Where's the DNA? Where's the fingerprints? I mean, it's like they want everything across the board and having had investigated it for 18 months before they'll even mm-hmm. touch it. 
Whereas a DA will get, you know, a, a murder case where the files may be, you know, a quarter of an inch thick and they've got a couple of reports and a couple of eyewitnesses and, and put 12 people in the box and see what happens. So one of the things that I, I never really liked about doing civil cases and from time to time we do them is you've got depositions and, and depositions for those who don't know or you sit a witness down and you spend all this time questioning the witness so you know what they're going to say at trial. In a state court trial, we don't know what the witness is going to say. We have some idea, but but it's really you have to think on your feet. In federal court, when you see a federal prosecutor start asking questions, they've got every question and every answer already typed out. They know they've rehearsed it. They've practiced it. All right. Well, let's give folks a, a quick understanding of where things stand with R. Kelly. And please feel free to jump in to add whatever details, because you know this far better than than myself. Robert Sylvester Kelly, the 54-year-old R&B singer and producer better known as R. Kelly, is currently on trial in the Brooklyn Federal Courthouse in New York. Prosecutors rested their case just this Monday, September 20th. So far, we have seen five weeks of testimony, 45 witnesses, including 11 alleged victims. Steve, can you tell us how was it that you first happened to meet Robert Kelly and what was your involvement initially? Uh, well, initially, when I was dealing with Robert, we were going to um, sue the people who had stolen from him. You know, one of the tragedies of, of his situation is that I think that he sold uh, as many albums or more albums than anyone except Michael Jackson over a 20 year period. And wow. More than Whitney Houston, more than Celine. And when I first met him, he was living in a rented two bedroom apartment in the Trump Tower here in Chicago. Um, when, so was that? That, hmm? when was that? When was that? That was in, in 2018 when I first met him, he was living in a rented two bedroom apartment in the Trump Tower. And uh, uh, some people that knew him uh, put us in touch and, and we met uh, because he was very interested in pursuing those that had stolen from him. They, they stole his music, they stole his publishing, uh, they would have him book a concert for $500,000 and tell him they only got $100,000. Um, they would book concerts and he wouldn't perform at them and they would keep the upfront money that they had gotten, some of his management, and then they would uh, uh, you know, tell him that we didn't fulfill this contract and he would end up having to pay the guarantee back. Oh, wow. So they did all sorts of stuff like that to him. Um, and it was it was really, really sad. And then as he and I were exploring that, we had some forensic accountants that were starting to look at things. Um, he uh, this this whole surviving R. Kelly, mute R. Kelly movement started. Uh, so we started to explore whether he was going to need representation in that regard. Uh, Clearly, it wasn't the time you were going to file a lawsuit, and uh, but that's how I got to know him. You know, I have to say that that I, I know what the general persona is, or, or what people say. Uh, I dealt with him a lot. I was at his home. I would go out with him. Um, he was a gentleman. Uh, he was fun to be with. I never saw anything going on. Um, I, I frankly, I never saw him mistreating anyone. I dealt with his then girlfriends. I didn't perceive that there were any problems. Had I, I, I would have walked away. Um, but I didn't see any of the things that people say uh, about the control. Um, you know, they had the TV series where they where they said that uh, uh, people were literally chained to the floor and all that. I yeah. didn't see any hooks. I didn't see any any uh, you know. Someone needed to go to the bathroom, they went to the bathroom. Someone wanted to come and go, they they came and went. I saw his girlfriends uh, while we were there. Hey, we're going shopping, okay, bye. You know, I didn't see any of the things that, that they've alleged. Yeah, well, they've alleged some, like you, you, you allude to, some pretty heavy duty stuff. I mean, there's, there's allegations of kidnapping, of keeping people without food. Um, right. and, and we'll we'll get into some of all of that, but eventually you, became his criminal defense attorney. At some point, he, he he was indicted for charges in Chicago, correct? Right, right. I, I'll, I'll never forget that day. So um, obviously, I've been around a long time. I get a, a heads up. Uh, and it was 
it was during the same time that the whole Jesse Smollett thing was mm-hmm. going on in Chicago. Um, so I get a heads up that Kelly's being indicted and uh, they tell me, you know, we've got a, a warrant for him and we're going to wait. We're going to give you a chance to turn him in. You have till I think it was seven o'clock at night to turn him in. And I, I happen to not have any court that day. I go over to his studio. I meet with them and, and we talk about it. And, and it was very surreal because uh, they had this warrant for him. So the entire street in front of his studio was filled with police cars, uh, marked police cars, unmarked police cars, even though they had said they were going to let him turn himself in. And when the ca- time came for him to turn himself in, uh, we left and this caravan of police cars is following. I was in my car. Uh, he was in his car. But it was just so I, I almost felt like the OJ slow speed chase right. from years ago because there was this whole caravan following and helicopters up above going along, following us to the police station where he turned himself in. Um, it, it was it was really a, a circus atmosphere. Oh, I can imagine. I mean, here, like you said, it, it, I mean, he was one of the biggest pop stars in the world at, at, at one point. Right. This was, I mean, I wasn't living in Chicago, but it was certainly something that captured everyone's attention that day. Right. Um, and then, and then after he turned himself in, and and he obviously had to remain at the at the police station overnight till he went to bond court the next day. Uh, when we got him out, I walked out of the police station, and there was that wall of lights and cameras which I've been involved in some pretty high profile cases. I never saw anything. I mean, you couldn't move. I I was scared. Wow. Wow. Pretty incredible. You had mentioned how he you got word that there was an indictment and that there was a warrant. Can you help us understand what you mean by that? What is an indictment? How does that operate? Sure. The the way that someone gets criminally charged, we've all heard of the grand jury. Uh, So the prosecutors will present a case to a grand jury and ask the grand jury to return an indictment. The Constitution, both the federal constitution and the state constitution, uh, in, in at least here in Illinois, require that before you can be formally charged with a criminal offense, that a grand jury finds that there's probable cause. That's all the indictment means. Um, I don't know what it meant back at the time of, as they like to say, the framers, when, when they first came up with this. Now it's kind of a joke. Uh, They say, you know, that the grand jury would indict a cocker spaniel or a ham sandwich if a prosecutor asked you were (laughs) you were a prosecutor. So you understand that to get an indictment, they typically have someone go in front of the grand jury. Did you investigate this case? Yes. Did you determine the person committed this offense? Yes. Did you determine that after talking to witnesses? Yes. And that's it. I mean, the grand jurors only hear one side of of what's going on. And right. And it's usually so. Uh, I don't know. A prosecutor would have to want the grand jury to say no indictment in order for the grand jury to say it. Right. That usually and, only happens when they want to indict cops. Right. Or and not that's indict them. something important to understand, too, is that these proceedings are private. This isn't like uh, here in California, we have a preliminary hearing. Uh, which is something that follows a felony that is that kind of probable cause determination before a trial. In most cases, go through a prelim, but the prelims open to the to the public. People can walk right. in. the The press can walk in. A grand jury is behind closed doors. N- n- oftentimes, many times, most of the time, the way it's supposed to work is no one is aware it's going on except those people who've been subpoenaed to testify at it. And then all of a sudden, you're right. Uh, you find out you've got criminal charges against you, and this may have been a grand jury that's been going on for some period of time. And the other right. thing you point out is there's no defense attorney in the room. Right. I've never been actually in front of a grand jury. I've represented lots of witnesses before the grand jury, but we're not even allowed to go in uh, at that point to the grand jury. So here in, in Chicago, in, in Cook County, uh, they have a regular sitting grand jury that sits three days a week for a month at a time. And um, as you can imagine, it's, it's basically a revolving door of, of cases. Uh, the indictments in this case, the state court indictments, they return four indictments and the transcripts on each are maybe three pages. I oh, mean, wow. it, it's kind of a joke. Wow, 
the other point I was I wanted to kind of nail down for folks to understand is that it's on the prosecutor, it's on the government to present any kind of exculpatory evidence at these grand juries. So not true. Like, go ahead. Not true in Illinois. Not okay, tell me everywhere. about that. Okay. Not true everywhere. So in New York, a the defendant has a right to present evidence to a grand jury. In other places, the prosecutor has an obligation to present exculpatory evidence. In Illinois, neither exist. In Illinois, a prosecutor, there can be 10 witnesses who say that the person they want to accuse is the wrong person, and they can have the wit one witness who says it's the right person and get an indictment. Now, they'd be wasting their time because they're going to lose the case, right? right? Um, but, but they've no got themselves obligation. an indictment. Yep. Yeah. No. Um, tell us. Okay. So initially, there's the 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 Illinois case, right? And that's a federal indictment that comes out. No. the The initial initially in Illinois, uh, Kelly was indicted for four separate state court cases. Okay. Um, all dating way back in time. Uh, one of the cases, the girl had come forward when Kelly was facing state charges back in the 2000s, and the prosecutors had decided there wasn't enough evidence. Uh, I think that this go round, the, the idea to indict him in state court in Illinois was, uh, I think influenced would be an understatement by the TV show. I think that the our county prosecutor here felt compelled to do something because of the TV show. The docu-series. The docu, well, I like to call it a TV show because <laughs> I like to think that a documentary, uh, they have done some investigation. In, in that show, they just simply paraded a bunch of people without any of sort of the background, without ever showing that what the people said was true. You know, normally uh, in a documentary, someone will describe an event and then you will see footage of that event or you will see other people who confirm that event. In, in this TV show that they put together, they simply went ahead and had people tell a story. And unfortunately, everyone accepted that as true. How do you think that affected their decision? The prosecutors? Yeah. I think, I think that all of the prosecutors uh, across the board were influenced by that television show and as proof, I would cite to you that in the uh, federal trial, which we're going to discuss in New York, they had a a, uh, um, a Homeland Security agent testify that as a result of the TV show, they opened an investigation into R. Kelly. I mean, they came right out and said it. Wow. Incredible. And this is all uh, taking place in the background of the, the Me Too movement as well, right? Right, right. No. Yep. Okay, so you, you alluded to it, but eventually, and if you can explain to us how this happens, eventually they open up a case in New York that is federal. Uh, R. Kelly gets charged in, uh, I want to say, February of 2019 in Illinois. And and we hear rumors that the, that the feds are investigating, and every once in a while I hear about a witness you know, I was subpoenaed by the Fed. So I know something's going on. Uh, and they keep saying they're investigating also in New York. In July of 2019, I get a call that says that Robert's been arrested by federal agents. I don't think to this day that the feds in Chicago, the federal prosecutors in Chicago and the federal prosecutors in New York had any real coordination the New York prosecutors had actually indicted him on what they call a sealed or secret indictment. So, so their indictment had been returned the month before, but they hadn't done anything. Chicago was about to return an indictment, and I think they had a territorial war. New York came in and arrested him. Uh, I think trying to, frankly, steal the thunder uh, and get the case in New York first. So how now I'm even thoroughly confused. How 
how do things stand right now? He does he still have the state court case in Chicago? So right now, Robert has four state court cases in Illinois, one pending federal indictment in Illinois, uh, a trial finishing in New York, um, a laughable charge in Minnesota. Okay. How? How are those all going to affect each other? And and what about this idea of double jeopardy? What not this overlapping and piling on? So I think that to the extent uh, there's double jeopardy, it's most going to come into play in the state court cases in Illinois. Uh, we have, there. there's, I don't know how much in the weeds you want to get. There's double jeopardy where they talk about crimes having the same elements and there's double jeopardy where they say a state crime and a federal crime can't uh, cancel each other out because they're separate sovereigns for for those that don't know what that means. It's as if they're two separate countries. Right. So you can't have double jeopardy, uh, which is kind of an absurdity, but the Supreme Court seems to like it. Um, Illinois has a statute that says that if the same facts arise, if there's factual overlap between a federal prosecution or a different state prosecution and Illinois, that uh, statutory double jeopardy, we'll call it that, would apply. And I think the Illinois cases, that's gonna happen. Uh, Some of the so-called victims in those cases testified in the New York case already. Okay. Um, And frankly, if, if, if he gets convicted in federal court, He's going to get time. The state court cases, as you probably, it's probably no different there. The state court prosecutors are just going to abandon their cases. Yeah, I Um, I was going to say it'll all start to fall like dominoes mm -hmm. if he gets convicted in that federal case. Right. Uh, The federal case in Illinois, while I think that we had a good theory to try and work some jeopardy overlap and we tried the New York case, uh, the federal case here in Illinois is largely different than that case. The case here is an obstruction case um, for obstructing his earlier child pornography prosecution. And uh, uh, to that extent, I don't know what their position is going to be. Um, They may or may not uh, proceed with that case if he is convicted in New York. Obviously, if he beats the New York charges, if he beats the most serious charges, they'll for sure go ahead on that case. Um, If he doesn't beat those charges, I frankly don't know what they'll do. Um, We're going to find out. Uh, We actually have a status in that case tomorrow. But I can't can't speculate. Uh, I know that we're going to be prepared to fight those cases, just as I was prepared to fight the New York charges. Okay. Let's, if you don't mind, let's turn to that New York case uh, just Mm -hmm. a bit, if you can help us, uh, because I know you have some pretty strong feelings about how they've charged this. So he's pled not guilty to one count of racketeering, which has 14 underlying acts, including kidnapping, forced labor, sex trafficking, as well as eight counts of violating, which is known as the Man Act. Uh, So let's take this apart a little bit. The, the racketeering, he's accused of using, and I, I want you to kind of explain this for folks, but he's essentially accused of using his managers, bodyguards, employees, and runners to help recruit and transport victims. Don't forget the sound guy. The, the sound guy, the lighting guy, the ticket taker, everyone. Basically, what they said is that uh, R. Kelly's entire existence uh, the way he lived his life personally and at work was a criminal enterprise. Um, everyone, and that's they're a, saying, sorry to cut uh, you off, but that's important that they prove this enterprise, right? Right. Although, uh, uh, well, I, I, I don't think that the prosecutors did. I'm, I fear that, that the defense may have. Um, so their theory is that Everybody who worked for R. Kelly, everybody he was friends with, everybody he associated with had a, a, at least a purpose. One of their purposes was to um, help R. Kelly 
engage in sex. And they say it was illegal sex because they were either minors or if they weren't minors, they were people that he held against their will uh, and that or they were people that he transmitted herpes to. And um, so that so everyone he associated with there, they were they were helping him to do this. Now, that's not what Rico certainly was designed for. Yeah, tell, uh, and, tell us and, what Rico is, how it's normally used, how people usually Rico, understand it. Sure, Rico, it, the Racketeering Influence uh, and Corrupt Organizations Act, or something like that. We've just yep. always called it Rico. It was enacted back in the seventies um, to prosecute mob, the mob, and, and the reason they enacted it was because the mob bosses were avoiding getting in trouble by saying, you know, the other people did the stuff, we didn't do it. So, so the underlings would get in trouble and the bosses wouldn't. So they said, look, if you're in charge of an organization, if you're running an organization, if you're a part of an organization who's engaged in criminal activities and the structure of that organization is dependent on, to some extent, those criminal activities, everyone in that organization is involved in a RICO enterprise. So they would say, you're gonna be punished depending on what the underlying crime was. So if the underlying crime was uh, a shakedown scheme, you know, you, you would, they'd look to state law. And if state law said the shakedown uh, scheme was a 10 year penalty, you, RICO would maybe have a 20 year cap. But if it was murder or something like that, so if you were in an organization, that organization was killing people, you were responsible for those killings just because you're a member of that organization. And it allowed them to vastly expand how they could prosecute these people. And it also allows them to do what they've done in this case, to bring in 14 separate things, all unrelated, because they say that they all fall under this larger umbrella. They use it against uh, gangs, they use it against the mobs, uh, but they've never really used it except in one other case in this kind of a situation. And I really think that, um, you know, on appeal, they're, they're gonna be able to make some hay with this. What, what the prosecutors did in this case, for example, is they took this New York law that said that it was a misdemeanor to give someone a sexually transmittable disease. Uh, not, let me correct that because I fall into the same problem that that, that the uh, the judge fell into. There's a New York law that says that it is illegal to have sex if you have a sexually transmittable disease. To the best of my knowledge, no one has ever been prosecuted under that law. Never. It was enacted after World War II. Guys were coming back with the clap. And they wanted to discourage that, but they never prosecuted anyone uh, in the history of the law. So if you read that law, it means if you have some kind of sexually transmittable disease and the person you're with has the same disease, you still can't have sex. If they agree to it, you can't have sex. If you wear a condom, you can't have sex. There's no consent element in there. It's a wholesale prohibition on having sex, but it's a misdemeanor, right? Well, with the prosecutors in New York, and, and this, I'm sorry that this gets a little bit complicated. What they did is they said, yeah, but R. Kelly had a girl fly into LaGuardia, and then he took her to a gig he had in New Jersey, and they had sex in New Jersey. So he violated the New York law, but he took her to New Jersey to do it. So that makes it a violation of the Mann Act, which is a RICO, what they call a RICO predicate. So they took a misdemeanor no one's ever been prosecuted under and turned it into a federal felony um, through some contortion. The problem, and, and we had, at the time we uh, we were discharged, we had all sorts of motions that, that his defense team that he ended up with abandoned, which is really a shame. The problem with that is the New York law wasn't effective in New Jersey. It doesn't apply in New Jersey. So, so how can you have the New York law? 
So he's being charged with, <laughs> I'm trying to unwrap this myself, a right. misdemeanor crime that he moves somebody across a state line, but out of the jurisdiction where that crime applies, but because he moved them, the Man Act applies, that they're then folding into this whole RICO allegation. Uh, not quite. <laughs> I know that, I'd get it wrong somewhere. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I can't, you know, and it's just shocking that they, they, that they had haven't challenged us. And I, I would add, they haven't got it right in the jury instructions either. Um, they said that he violated a New York law in New Jersey. Right. Problem number one. That's, that's what they said. Right. And the Mann Act is going from New York to New Jersey for a quote unquote immoral purpose. The immoral purpose is to violate the New York law. But it's not a violation if you're in New Jersey. <laughs> okay, right? so I I get it. I I kind of think I'm starting to follow it. Um, what problems? Tell me how this works itself out, though. You said, like, first of all, you pointed out the jury instructions. How that's going to be a problem? It, it that that is a problem, and I don't I don't want to cry spilled milk. But again, we had. Uh, we got we were still involved when the jury instructions came we prepared voluminous objections to them that um the people he ended up going to trial with didn't file and so they left it unchallenged you know as you know as a criminal defense lawyer jury instructions are they're the least sexy part of the case right right i mean every time i get involved in a big case and i get 80 pages of jury instructions sent to me by the prosecution the first thing i do is I give them to the second chair and I say, you know, figure out the problems with these. <laughs> right. But you got to figure out the problems with them. So uh, many of the instructions that they've got um, misstate the underlying crimes. So you're going to have jurors who are going to be instructed in the next couple of days improperly on what the law is. I have a question on, on some of these this evidence that sounds like it's coming in some of it is uncharged acts right there there's alec there's people who are testifying to uh things that have been videotaped to allegedly seeing sort of sex acts taking place but those aren't the things that they're testifying to aren't actually charged right. crimes correct how correct. is that coming in on this trial is it all under that rico uh theory so uh it, it, as is typical in, in um, almost every federal prosecution that I've been involved in, they go to introduce what's called 404B or other bad acts evidence. And they've done it in this case. There's a few problems with, with that in, in this particular proceeding. Um, the first is that uh, a lot of the bad acts that they, that they claim took place really have nothing to do with what he's charged with. You know, if if I had been calling the shots in this case, I frankly, from a strategic standpoint, would have said, we will stipulate to the sex. He had sex with these people. And then you wouldn't have had to get into all the nitty gritty and all of the sort of, because people are all caught up in the fact that, uh, oh, geez, he had sex with uh, someone crawling out from under a boxing ring and he had sex with a guy and he had this and he had that. Who cares? That's not what he's charged with. Right. And and nobody, you know, even if, if, if R. Kelly got on the stand and said, I didn't have sex with these people, no one would believe him. If he parades 20 witnesses, no one's going to believe him because in our minds, in everyone's mind, this is what superstars do. Right. They do that, you know. Right. By the same token, he doesn't have to go trolling around for women because he is a superstar. Right. So so all of that. Um, so the government has presented all of this other crime stuff, and all they've been able to do is paint him in a bad light. How did that happen in this case? Um, they filed a very lengthy motion. It was about 55 pages detailing what they wanted to present. And unfortunately, Kelly's counsel, uh, not me, I wasn't involved then, Kelly's counsel filed a 12-page response, which looked like it was written by a, a first-year law student because it only cited 
one U.S. Supreme Court case, uh, which is sort of the leading case on at Huddleston, but really didn't get down in the weeds and falsely claimed that they hadn't received any of these materials in discovery when, in fact, the very attorney who wrote that response had picked up the flash drive with the materials from the U.S. Attorney's Office. So I think that went over uh, after the prosecutors pointed that out to the judge in their response. I think that went over like the proverbial lead balloon. And at that point, you know, you're trying to convince the judge to, to, to come around to your side, misrepresenting stuff to a judge, yeah. uh, you know, making her think it's amateur hour. That's not really going to work. No. No, it's not. And I, 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 like you said, not to get too into too much into the weeds on this, but this is really important stuff. In and I want you to kind of explain to us how this might be different. But in California, part of our evidence code inclu- includes a section called 1108, which is allows for specifically in cases involving sex crimes, allows for prior uncharged allegations right. of, of of sex acts to prove specifically preponderance, which is amazing. Because essentially, so folks understand what that's saying is, I can have a very, very weak case, a very, very weak sex case. But if I can find two or three other folks who also might have as equally weak cases to the point that they're not even charged as crimes, I can bring all of that in specifically to show He's done it before. He must well, have done it here. Did. That's what they did to Bill Cosby. That's exactly right. what they did to Bill Cosby. Right. And, and and my friend Jennifer, uh, who's this very fine lawyer and won his appeal, uh, in the first trial, Jennifer Bonjean. came in. Jennifer Bonjean. So in yeah. the first trial, one, one of the acts came in. Jennifer was actually going to do this case with us uh, for a period of time. Um, but one of the acts came in. And then... When, when the jury hung and the judge said, oh, my God, I want Cosby to get convicted, the judge then said, I'm going to allow in more acts. Yeah. The problem in this case, the problem in Kelly's case, is it's not a sex case. He's not charged with sex. He's charged with racketeering. And that's what nobody gets. That's what, what all of his defense team has missed, is that... It doesn't matter. The sex doesn't matter. Yes, some of the predicate acts are sexual in nature. But again, that's not something you're going to win in front of the jury. I didn't have sex. You know, it's it's not like the Bill Clinton defense. I didn't have sex with that woman. Right? It's right. just not believable. Okay? The 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 point of attack was was in the enterprise, the structure. Are they doing these things? And they have to do them to maintain or increase their position. In other words, the the people doing these things have to benefit. What was that evidence like? You know, you had someone saying, we were told to give out his phone number to women, not girls, not young women, not underage women, women at the concert. Go give his number to good looking women at the concert. Is that really something that anyone finds shocking or or necessarily wrong? Or is that something that, uh, you know, they they just had Lollapalooza. I'm sure there were performers <laughs> at Lollapalooza in Chicago who had guys going out and, and, and or women performers who had, had people going out and, and getting them people to meet. I think the problem, the problem with R. Kelly is that everybody, including, uh, you know, a good portion of his, his defense team, um, just lost focus about what the case was about. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I want to change gears uh, kind of drastically for a second because I think it's something that a lot of folks uh, uh, are interested in. But he, this Gail King interview that R. Kelly does, mm-hmm. this is in March of 2019. Were you, I mean, you're still his lawyer now in Chicago, correct? I am, yes. Were, were you involved in that decision at all for him to do that interview? So I don't want to get into uh, things that are privileged okay. and, and what was discussed with them um, would be privileged. What I will say is that when you're when you're dealing with uh, someone who is not a celebrity versus a celebrity, yeah, 
the way they look at how they have to portray yeah. themselves is very, very different. Yes. Uh, and um, uh, keeping a celebrity, uh, getting them to understand that that they should say nothing, they should post nothing, uh, they should do nothing is impossible. I mean, I don't know that you see any celebrity uh, doing that. Now, having said that, I I thought the interview, and maybe I was biased, I thought he did a good job. Had R. Kelly sat down at that interview and been stoic, everyone would have said, look at him. He doesn't care. He's rehearsed. You know, he has no feeling. He got up there and he said, he said, what are they doing to me? And he was very emotional. And everyone said, oh, my God, he's losing it. Look at him. He's losing it. What was he supposed to do? No matter what he did, he couldn't win because the haters were going to hate. Right. And the lovers were going to love. And that's kind of the whole point is there's no winning in that situation. And I, and I do agree with you. I think celebrities, and this is coming from a little bit of experience myself, celebrities have felt I've created this entire career, this entire empire by having a microphone in front of me. And mm -hmm. I'm, an, I'm an entertainer and people want to hear what I have to say. And when you turn to them and go, not now. Now is not the time. They say, I have, I have built what I am today and I've saved myself before by putting a microphone in front of me, put a microphone in front of me, and then the consequences that it has, we, we, we can see. Right. One of the things that I've noticed with, with uh, is we, we like to call them celebrity clients, is that they're very conscious of the blogosphere and what people are, are saying. Yep. You know, So if you watch this trial every night, there's all this stuff that people post. Some of it, uh, you know, the, and and then they rip each other. The people posting rip what the other people have posted and say that, uh, you know, they're not getting it right and only I'm getting it right. Um, I, I found that uh, Robert was overly sensitive to that. And, and, and it, with many of these people, it's difficult to get them to understand that all that matters is what those 12 people in the room think and what those 12 people in the room hear. And that's all that matters. And they don't get that. They care about what, you know, uh, this person who it turns out only has, you know, 700 followers or 16 right. followers or whatever, uh, what they say. And I found that to be a, a distraction, an unnecessary distraction and really, um, counterproductive and 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 probably my least favorite part of dealing with the case. Yeah, yeah. All right. So um, June 2021. This is coming from CNN. Says half of his legal team talking about R. Kelly attorneys Steve Greenberg and Michael Leonard withdraw from the case, leaving Tom Farinella and Nicole Blank Becker as Kelly's legal representatives. I don't want to put you in a position, but talk to us about what happened, Steve. Um, I think that uh, so. So we would have a series and I don't want to get again into privilege stuff. Yeah, we would we would meet with him uh, regularly several days a week uh, going over the discovery and so forth. And there was work that needed to be done. It's very time consuming. Uh, two to three hours on those three days. And there was all this other work um, that needed to get done, motions that needed to be done. Uh, uh, discovery that needed to be sort of worked through and, and things done with it, follow-up investigation. Um, and we would be on these calls uh, and someone needed to do the work. So so Mike and I were doing the work, the actual legal work that needed to be done. Uh, and we needed to do it because quite frankly, and I'm not saying anything that I haven't said before, and I'm not saying anything that I think the world will if they don't agree with it now, they're going to come to agree with it. Um, the others were incapable of it. You know, Nicole had never set foot in federal court, had never tried a federal case. Uh, Tom claimed to have set foot in federal court. Um, he couldn't write a sentence. Uh, he couldn't He couldn't articulate a sentence. Um, everything they, they put out was just filled with, with legal, factual, and grammatical errors. And so we said... You guys do these meetings and we will, uh, you know, we'll take care of this stuff. 
And uh, there was some dispute about who was going to do what in the case, who was going to have what witnesses. Um, and uh, frankly, Mike and I are of the firm belief that they started lying to Kelly about things. Uh, they started telling him that that uh, uh, that and they put this in a pleading, shockingly, that we were allowing the federal agents to eavesdrop on our meetings and so forth, stuff like that. Um, and eventually at some Is point, that true? Of course not. Of course <laughs> okay. not. Um, uh, and, and the fact you even ask that question is an insult, <laughs> frankly. Um, but at some point, they somehow, and aided by some of these bloggers that Kelly cared about, uh, uh, just got his ear. They were, they were uh, to be honest with you, from the day um, they got involved, uh, I think that that um, that if I had to choose a phrase to describe them would be incompetent backstabbers. Wow. Um, and and I think that you know I, I don't want to just sound like sour grapes. I hope they win the case. Right. Um, I think that that if people follow uh, the opening statement, which was a bone of contention, uh, who is going to give the opening? Uh, I think that the the from anyone who's in the know and universally was. Uh, it was one of the worst opening statements ever. Um, those two have not stood up in the courtroom to question a witness. My understanding is for weeks now, because eventually Kelly saw what we told him. Uh, I think the judge saw it uh, and sat them down. Uh, if you have the, you know, I, I think that if R. Kelly gets convicted, that he has a strong chance of the case coming back on an ineffective assistance claim. I know Mr. Kanick, Devereaux Kanick, I've, I've spoken to him and I've, I've texted with him during the trial. He's doing the best he can, but you can't just do this trial with one person. And 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 sort of by the time he got in, you know, he was already there with, with both hands tied behind his back because he had to work with these two people who belong on the Mount Rushmore of, of ineffective assistance and incompetent counsel. Wow. Have you followed? And, and, I, and I, I hate to say that because people are going to say he's just irritated. No, my interest is in Kelly winning his case. I believe that he should win this case. I believe that that this is not a Rico enterprise that he is running. Did he do stuff wrong? Sure. Has he done some bad things in his life? Yes. Has he done what they accused him of? Absolutely not. But, you know, you can't bring a, a, a squirt gun to a knife fight. Wow. All right. Last question I have, because now it's turned to the defense side of things. And have you been following the case closely? It sounds like you have. I, I don't have a choice because people are constantly texting me. Okay. Um, I mean, the question is going to come up, and, and maybe this is a no-brainer for you, but this is always a big question uh, for any uh, defense attorney should Kelly testify? Well, I think they've already told the judge it's not going to. What are your thoughts about that? Uh, you know, again, that would get into um, privileged things. Sure. I think that uh, I think that anyone can look at a, at a case like this and just look at all the other stuff that they already have been able to bring up. Imagine uh, the parade of people they would bring in to say bad things about R. Kelly if he testified yeah you know they, yeah. they'd be there another three four weeks and and the defense would never get a chance to rebut it so uh, i i certainly would have done everything i could to keep him from testifying yeah and i think that's what they've done and i think that's something maybe that'll... i think i think that if they allowed him to sing the, <laughs> I, mean, I have to tell you so 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 this is a uh i don't know if, if people know this um in, in June of 2019, well, in July of 2019, uh, I moved from my house where I had lived for, for 26 years, and I was moving to the city. So the third weekend in June, I had a party at my house. This was before Robert had been charged, and he came to the party uh, with some of his friends, and I had a band. And he, he was, not only was he a gentleman, um, but he performed for three hours at wow. my party that night with my band uh he performed in fact um i know that they said the police give him a, a break 
this was in the suburbs uh, and and he didn't start performing till 1030 and with breaks he didn't stop till three in the morning and the police in fact came and said well this is really cool we're gonna <laughs> we're gonna just ignore ignore the calls for that that was his last public performance wow um and man is he ta- i mean he did frank sinatra songs and he did his own songs and he did other people's songs and it, it was really it was really something to see i mean he is he is a once in a lifetime talent and it, it's just a shame what has happened to him because i know that i know that people are gonna i'm gonna get get daggers for this and people are gonna say bad things but uh, he may have done some bad things. I think the things he did in the nineties are much different than the things he did after that, after he got charged in 2002, I think he lived a much different life. And I, I, I like him. I want him to win. I think he's a good guy. I think he means well, I think he's charitable. And I think that almost every single person that's ever come in contact with him has taken advantage of him. Incredible. Well, I think it's a it's an American. It, it really is on many levels an American tragedy. I I can completely understand your position, and I think that, like you said, uh, people run hot and cold on this whole thing, and you probably are going to get a lot of comments on it. But I, I tell you one thing that I think is very clear is that you are a zealous advocate on his behalf, and we're going to be paying close attention to what happens in the the next few weeks and a uh, few days and we'll be cl- paying close attention to how things work out with your representation of him um, but unfortunately that's our show for this week so steve thank you so much for coming on um where can people find out more about you uh they can uh look me up i guess on google i think we have a website it's okay. uh greenberg trial lawyers.com Sounds I'm good. I'm fairly certain. Okay, sounds good. And I'm your host, Joshua Ritter. You can find me and follow me on Instagram at Joshua Ritter ESQ. As always, you can find our podcasts on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, and Google Podcasts, and also on YouTube. And thank you so much for joining us at the Sidewalk.